And away we go. It's another edition of the Arrowhead Pride Editor's Show. My name is Pete Sweeney. I'm the editor-in-chief of arrowheadpride.com. Joined not by the executive editor, John Dixon, out this week again, but we have here with me our podcast producer, Steve Serta. Steve, we are starting this recording about 20 minutes after 3 p.m. Arrowhead time, which means we have on our hands the new... NFL year. What is your NFL New Year's resolution? What is it? Do you have one? Um, really, it's just to take time off because mm. I feel like I've just been waiting around for the Chiefs to make a big move and they haven't really done much. I mean, they've made big moves that we are, are happy that they'll that they made and we'll we'll discuss those and everything, but I'm taking some time off next week, so it's going to be you and John back here. I'm not going to be around. I've been in a lot last yeah. couple of weeks, and so if the Chiefs are going to make a move, it would be very convenient if they would do that before I take some time off next week. Yeah, there you go. That's a good way to start the new year by wanting to take off immediately. That's what, that's the kind <laughs> of energy we need at Arrowhead Pride. By the way, John's okay, if anyone's worried. He has some dental stuff going on right now. Uh, wouldn't have sounded uh, that that smooth baritone voice that he's able to provide each and every week. And so giving him another week, we should, as Steve kind of mentioned, we believe, have the editor show with me and John full go uh, back to you know, where you know we've been uh, in previous off seasons every Wednesday moving forward. So cross our fingers. We I know we've been teasing it for a while now. Steve, you've been doing a great job filling in, but we think we're we're finally going to be good to go starting next week we have no reviews this week so we can get right into it but i should remind you if you leave us a rating and a review on apple itunes we appreciate all the five star reviews you guys have been great at that we'll read it on the show you can ask a question you can make a comment and john and i will comment on it so steve as, as you were alluding to the the new year has started you know the the tampering period is now over teams can move about freely in their cabins as they go here and from what we've seen so far, not a lot of movement with Kansas City when it comes to bringing new players in. There has been a lot going on with a couple players, a couple fan favorites leaving for other teams. They made a minor move by bringing in an out outside body. They, of course, were able to lock up the number one free agent, which we're going to get to first. But again, not a lot of that, those spicy moves that I, I think we've been seeing from, from other teams. And this is probably a good time to remind you all that this was the case last year. And look, uh, I'm not going to rag on the entire fan base like I sometimes do on this show and tell everyone to relax because I actually have noticed in the comments this year and in the replies and stuff, it's not as bad as it was last year because the Chiefs were kind of quiet last year, Steve. And I think people were getting upset when they were seeing all this movement, especially always in the, the AFC West. They're always trying to have this arms race to catch up with Patrick Mahomes. But have you sensed, and do you agree with me before we get into the Chris Jones stuff, that uh, it seems like fans, although they're eager, right? They're a little bit calmer of the Chiefs kind of staying pat because I think that in Veach, in Veach we trust thing uh, has become more of a reality now, especially after the back-to-back -back Super Bowls. Well, I think the only reason there hasn't been a massive freak out uh, just yet from Chiefs fans is because they were able to get this thing done with Chris Jones and, and bring him back. Because last season, it was like, what are they going to do about him? And then they mm -hmm. franchise tag him and he's a holdout. And it's like a whole thing that gets that gets drawn out into the regular season. But this year, they didn't have that option. Like we knew they weren't going to tag Chris Jones. So it was a matter of either get a deal done with him or you don't. And he hits the open market and he's probably gone because somebody's going to offer him way more money than you probably can. And it was just nice to see that they were able to, in fact, get that done. It was at the last minute, like right before free agency actually opened and the legal yeah. tampering period came across for the NFL. But I, I mean, that's the biggest thing. Like the chiefs, we, we've seen them make these moves and move off these kinds of players in the past, but mm -hmm. now definitively it's, the cornerstones are Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, and Chris Jones. And that's the reason that they paid him. That's the reason that they gave him an extension. And I totally agree with the move. Like, I was like, bring him back. Like, you, you need him. You don't have anybody to replace him. And if he winds up walking and, and signing with another team in free agency, I think the freak out is on if Chris Jones doesn't re-up here in Kansas City. 
Yeah, and I, I think when you look at it, the Chiefs really have been smart with their money and they've picked their spots. And we have seen players that were big fan favorites, like a Tyron Matthew comes to, to mind, where he very clearly wanted to stay in Kansas City, was a key part of what they were able to do in 2019. And it, it just never worked out where they were able to come to in a long-term agreement. Tyron Matthew ended up moving on. And it really became a tendency since 18 and, and Beach took over of this idea where you know, once a player gets to that 28, 29, 30 uh, year old mark, you you think about, OK, is it smarter for us to save that money and to continue to use it as we surround Patrick Mahomes with a lot of talent? But I think like the franchise came out last night. I, I think it was interesting that immediately, first of all, the Chiefs are blessed to have Patrick Mahomes immediately after winning his second Super Bowl in a row, he pivots and he's telling everyone, yeah, we won three. This is like moments after the Super Bowl. He did it with Chris Jones on stage telling him, look, you're not going anywhere. And I think it's important because this is a player that that is no longer a young man in terms of the NFL. I mean, he's been the chief starter for, what, six, seven years now. And he has some influence in the front office. Andy Reid listens to him. Brett Beach listens to him. This also could have been a Patrick Mahomes thing where it's, you know, we can't afford to lose this guy. And I, I think there is some, something to be said about defensive tackles. We've seen Aaron Donald have success uh, at the age that Chris Jones is now going into his age 30 season. And so what the chiefs did, they said, look, we're going to bite the bullet. We're going to get uh, Chris Jones locked up in a five-year deal. It, it contains $95 million guaranteed. And he probably has a, a really good chance to retire a chief. We got to talk to him yesterday. That, that's something I asked him, you know, how does that feel? And, and he said deep down, he, he never had a doubt, but I could tell from some of his uh, ex posts or tweets over the years, Steve, that there were some times where Chris Jones was doubting and, and how much the chiefs valued him, but there's uh, nothing better than actually getting that thing done. You wonder how much the $95 million guarantee thing goes into the fact that he's number 95 but it, it is it is a a move that uh is interesting in the sense that i think you were looking at a chief's defense that was going to uh, take a step back in some capacity without him and i was wondering and i i said this on our arrowhead pride report if the chiefs would just bite the bullet because they felt like okay we've been really good at evaluating talent we can figure out a way for where the defense is good enough. And I think now, uh, as I mentioned on that report, you can get it right here on the AP Podcast Network, but now you keep that ceiling of having a, a top five defense and we'll continue to see what happens with the offense. The Chiefs are working, we believe, to uh, find a, a way to improve it from one year to another. But I think the fact that you can kind of keep that top five defense now is a big deal in this grand chance to win three which again, like you go to the mic'd up with the franchise and NFL films and all that, they've been thinking about like moments after McCola Hardman caught that ball in overtime. They want three and they're going to be doing everything in their power to make that happen. And this was, I think, the first big move toward that. They weren't letting Chris Jones go. And I, I, one more point, Stephen, I'll let you weigh in here. But Christian Wilkins signs this mega deal with the Las Vegas Raiders moments into the tampering period like you can bet your ass that had the chiefs not found a way to keep jones the raiders would have came after him hard and no better quote i thought from jones yesterday than when a colleague of ours uh espn's adam teicher was asking you know could you have seen yourself playing for the raiders or another team like that and and in a kanye west fashion jones says i, I guess we'll never know yeah it's it, it's really interesting to see how this is all kind of unfolded, because like if if everybody remembers back to when Patrick Mahomes signed his first extension with the Chiefs, he said, like, I left money on the table for Chris Jones because Chris Jones needed an extension at that point. And then we're here a few years later and kind of in a similar situation. But I, I think uh, based on what the Chiefs were able to get done this offseason compared to like where they were at last offseason, I do think there's been a lot of growth there. I think the season helped a lot. And we heard the guys say this multiple times, like Travis Kelsey has said it and other players have mentioned it that like last season was like one of the toughest seasons that they've ever gone through yeah. and like trying to figure things out and trying to get to where they wanted to go. And they were still able to accomplish that. But it, it was like they talked about how how sweet getting that one was over any of the other ones that they've been to prior because 
we could see it. Like there was legitimate doubt creeping into the minds of Chiefs fans over the course of this season. And yeah. midway through the year, it didn't seem like they had it. Like it just didn't seem like this was a championship caliber team outside of the defense. And they're able to put it all together. But I think overcoming all of that adversity, I think it can change you. And I, I think it kind of changed his stance too, where you know, drinks were flowing at the Super Bowl parade, but Chris Jones says, I'm not going anywhere. Like, I, I think that that was heavily influenced by them actually achieving this back to back status and now trying to go for three in a row. Like, I think there is something to all of that stuff in the way that they built up this locker room and the camaraderie. And now it is locked into place for the next couple of years that the core of Mahomes, Kelsey, and Jones is there. And I think that. Most teams across the NFL would absolutely kill to have a, a core of three players that are absolutely at the top of the league. And the Chiefs have that for the foreseeable future. Yeah. And as I talked to the team and, and had some conversations, like I, I was wondering if they would continue to have that energy where it's like, well, we have this hard stance where no matter how good you are, you know, as you enter the late 20s, early 30s, we're not going to do this. And I think it was a pivot special for this year. I think the Chiefs realize the opportunity they have. Like as great as it was to go back to back, we saw how much it meant to Travis Kelsey. It's it's been done before, you know, a number of times in NFL history, nearly nearly ten times. And this is something where if the Chiefs are able to do it, they're clearly the best dynasty uh, in NFL history. You know, I and I think just the opportunity to be able to at least have an attempt to do that and give it your best shot. They're going to keep a guy like Chris Jones, even if it means cr signing him to a five-year contract, Steve, where it's probably going to be good for definitely two, maybe three of the years, but then you're looking at a 33-year-old defensive tackle. This is a pivot from where the Chiefs uh, have been, I, I think, on these types of decisions in, in, in previous years, but now I think you're seeing them go, go after it, and I think that's great. I think it's a sign of things to come. We'll see. Uh, who knows if it'll happen as we're podcasting. We'll see which direction they go. Uh, when it comes to the wide receiver position and, and some other positions of need. But it starts with Chris Jones, and I know it, it hasn't necessarily been the sexiest free agency period for the Chiefs, but like if you can separate yourself from, uh, again, the fact that Jones has been here since the beginning of his career, the Chiefs landed the number one unrestricted free agent to be on the, the market. So yeah, it's not sexy because it's not a new name, but they have been active. And that was your point, you know, as we got going with this. All right, let's continue on here. Uh, we know that LeJerry Sneed uh, has been tagged. That is not new news, Steve, but Patrick Mahomes, he opted to do a, a restructure of his contract. These are, is, are those guarantee mechanisms. Mahomes signed a special contract. So on a year by year basis, the Chiefs could make more room for themselves so he gets a big fat check uh, in the form of a signing bonus and uh, i'm sure that's not so bad even as you're doing 17 state farm commercials steve but what it means for the chiefs is as they stand even with legerius need tagged and that money eaten up according to our john dixon who does a great job of, of keeping track of this cap you can you can check out our, our cap resource uh, on the arrowheadpride.com page but the chiefs right now have 14.9 million dollars worth of space and I just think this is another sign of the fact that Patrick Mahomes uh, really, really wants to catch Tom Brady. I've, I've been open with that on this podcast before. You know, I know it's a, a long way to go even still after having three Super Bowl titles. Um, but this is a Brady-esque move where he's just willing to do anything to make sure that these decision makers have an opportunity to try to bring in the best possible players around him. And I also think, and Jared Sapp, uh, a great writer for us uh, at AP, brought this up in the chat, and I think he's right. When you have a situation with LeJarius Sneed where he's eating up all that cap, I think it's nearly $19 million, something around there, you got to find a way to be cap compliant by 3 p.m., which happened uh, 30 minutes ago. And when you have that pressure, you see a team like the Los Angeles Chargers in the Chiefs division, they had to be cap compliant, but everybody knew it. So who's going to trade for Mike Williams or uh, Khalil yeah. Mack? You know, at that point, and so this was a, a situation where the Chiefs were under a little bit of pressure. Now I think it gives you time with Snead, and the Chiefs kind of say to everybody, "Like we're under the cap. We don't have to trade him to get under the cap." Our boy Mahomes, uh, John Dixon calls it the, the the bank of Mahomes. The bank of Mahomes was open, and now we can suddenly uh, again 
really get what Snead is worth if we decide to trade him. Or now you open up, he can play on the tag for one more year. Or maybe there is a uh, what I would call a shorter long-term extension, something in the ballpark of, of three seasons. Again, uh, the Chiefs may be going back to their tendency of not trying to go too far past 30. But I just think it all kind of plays into uh, everything here. And we'll see what happens next when it comes to that salary cap space. Yeah, I thought it was a great point by Jared. That it, it kind of felt like a move to say, like, we can carry Legereus needs cap it if we have to. <laughs> yeah. like. Because I do think there's teams that are, you know, calling up the Chargers, calling up the Chiefs, these teams that were right up against it cap wise and saying, like, listen, we'll give you a third round pick or we'll give you a, a third and a sixth or something like that for this guy to get that money off of your books. And the Chiefs are saying, like, no, oh, we've got the ability to free up the cap space. We can carry Legereus Sneed this season. And like I, I feel like that there it's kind of uh misinterpreted a, a lot across the league where it's people assume that it's so easy to trade these cap uh franchise tag players to free up cap space and it's not always an easy thing to do and and, and that too that doesn't always mean that the team that is placing the franchise tag on that player is like well we have to get rid of him like we yeah. we have we have we have to get rid of him to get that money off of the books i don't think that's necessarily the case i just right. think that the chiefs know this is a window that they have right here. And it was a matter of, can we extend Chris Jones or do we extend Legereus need? Well, when you have the talent that they have and the youth that they have in the secondary, I, I think it made more sense to franchise tag Legereus need because that was dramatically cheaper than franchise tagging Chris Jones. And long-term Chris Jones just plays a more valuable position for them over the next couple of years. So I, I'm not at a point where I think like Legereus needs definitively staying with the Kansas City Chiefs this season, but as this stuff gets drawn out, it ca does kind of feel like the Chiefs were kind of getting cap compliant and saying, well, we'll just carry the franchise tag and run it back with the secondary in this yeah. defense if we don't get what we want. And they should be getting good offers like Pittsburgh trading Deontay Johnson for what they did with the Carolina Panthers is insane because but Jerry Sneed would fit an immediate need for that team. Right. And they can give him a contract because they have cap space. And the fact that they didn't want to make that deal with the Chiefs is crazy because yeah. they would have gotten a better player in return. And so it kind of feels like that was the window to make a move on him if they were going to. Yeah. And and I think especially in the AFC and in, in some of the conversations I've had with people in the organization, like nobody is looking to help the Chiefs in any capacity. Like this idea is, that you which is annoying just because just because they've been winning more than you, you don't want to do anything with them well, now. I think a couple of years ago, right? We were a little surprised. This was before the dynasty and everything was solidified. We were a little surprised that the Baltimore Ravens, who have been a great conference rival to Kansas City, kind of bailed them out in a sense. You know, you have your opinions about Orlando Brown. I, I don't think there's anyone that could argue reasonably that Orlando Brown wasn't at least average for Kansas city. And they needed somebody that was at least average at that left tackle position. You know, I, I think he would tell you that he's above average, but that is a conversation that we've had <laughs> a long time ago. We don't need to get back into it. What I'm saying is like, I just think the days of any, any kind of trade like that happening are over. And I would even extend it, Steve, to the NFC contenders, whether, you know, you want to call that the, the Philadelphia Eagles, the 49ers now, certainly the Detroit Lions are, are going to be in that mix. I don't think anyone is is banging down Brett Veach's door to trade them a receiver. So even this one for one that, you know, you may get luxurious need. I, I still don't think teams are considering that because everybody knows how much better the offense would be if you had a legitimate receiver to pair with Rasheed Rice. And the Chiefs are clearly seeking that. And again, nobody trying to, to help them, no one trying to rush to do that. The reason they have a receiver opening, Steve, is because Marquez Valdez can't least. And right now we have heard some smoke on Curtis Samuel. There was a little bit on Darnell Mooney, but he ends up going to the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, now Mike Williams becomes a, a possibility. We alluded to it before. But the Chargers forced to part ways with Mike Williams just to get cap compliant by the start of the new league year. And he's taken some offers. He only played three games last year, had a significant injury, but could be ready for, for training camp because the injury was something that happened early in the season. I, I like this fit for KC. And I know that there's a lot of people from what I can see uh, on X in my mentions and some of our AP comments that would prefer Curtis Samuel, certain a play, certainly a player that I think Andy Reid would be able to do 
uh, a lot with just considering he's a little bit of one of those uh, dual threat type of guys. But man, uh, I I feel like you got to get Mahomes uh, someone who is a big target and can get him the 50-50 ball and he can go up and get it. And I tweeted this out, Steve, with Mike Williams and what he's been able to do uh, in Kansas City uh, at Arrowhead Stadium. And he has been absurd at Arrowhead Stadium in just five games in which he's had 50% or more snaps, 30 catches, 457 yards, and six touchdowns. Those are absurd numbers at Arrowhead in five games. So you bring this guy in, I think you know you have a quarterback in Patrick Mahomes. Who knows what the ceiling is? Uh, and again, kudos to Jared who mentioned this on, on X, but you can do that type of deal if he's willing that they did with Juju Smith-Schuster. Remember, Juju Smith-Schuster had the injury. There's a thing called uh, likely to be earned and not likely to be earned incentives. The key here, and this is probably wrong, probably shouldn't be this way, but the likely to be earned is based upon the previous season. So when a player like Mike Williams, who's a former first-round pick, only plays three games, you can push all of those salary cap uh, constraints to next year. So if he's willing to do one of these incentive-based deals based upon last year, to me, this is the guy. Like, you want a legitimate receiver in Kansas City? He's been a Chiefs killer at times, as I mentioned. Go and get Mike Williams. I'm not – Steve, you know this about me. I'm never big-name released, go-get-him guy. I, I hate that. But this is a different case for me because I, I just think – that these type of players don't be, become available ever, that often. Like it kind of reminds me of when Sammy Watkins suddenly was available where the Rams years ago, years ago, where the Rams wanted to keep him and they suddenly had to get rid of him and he just happened to be on the open market. That's Mike Williams. And I, I got to, I got to believe uh, Kansas City's inquiring. I think it's really interesting. Um, I, I like Mike Williams is a player and I do totally agree with you. Like I think coming off of that injury and he's a player who's, already gotten a decent payday in the NFL. So I don't think he's going to, you know, command some outrageous contract. And the Juju contract, I think, is is a really good place to start for a player like Mike Williams. Now, I, I don't know what his offers are going to be. And I think the wide receiver market hasn't been nearly as high volume as a lot of people were making it out to be. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Mike Evans took a team friendly deal and, you know, Michael Pittman and T Higgins don't wind up going anywhere. And now it's kind of down to Calvin Ridley and we're still kind of waiting to see what happens with him. But I, I do, I, I speculated about this a little bit before free agency. Like, are we going to see the wide receiver market kind of level off? And I feel like this, that kind of has been the case so far. Um, and and I, I don't think we're going to get any like groundbreaking wide receiver deals. So it does feel like you could get Mike Williams at a discount or, or at least at some kind of team friendly contract. I think, at this point, though, like with, with his injury history, because it's not just him coming off the serious knee injury. It's he's had back problems, had you know all, all kinds of issues during his time with the Chargers. And I, I think that's just kind of stacked up. So I'd just be a little bit weary about that. And the same thing kind of goes with Curtis Samuel, where I think Curtis Samuel is a good fit. And I would like to see what Andy Reid could do with Curtis Samuel, because I think Curtis Samuel is like a better all around wide receiver than McCole Hardman. And I think he could be a, play a very similar role to what McCole Hardman did for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, maybe a lot more cost effective. Like I, I'm at the point with the Chiefs where there's been enough success in the draft where I'm like cost effective veterans go draft another wide receiver, especially in a class that's deeper at the wide receiver position than any other position. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 with you. I I think cost efficient is smart, and I. I still think it's worth saying this and, and bringing up this point that if let, let's say Williams was the guy or let's say it's even Samuel, right? You're still looking at them having you know, that player as a second or third option, just depending on how you rank Kelsey and Rice. I know that Travis Kelsey looked to be a step slower last year, but I just really believe that that injury before week one hindered him because if you notice, once he was able to get enough rest, and you know, I think a big key to the season in the playoff run was him just taking himself out of the mix in week 18 and being able to essentially have a bye week. He looked pretty good in the playoff run. I, you know, I understand that there's the ultimate playoff motivation. It, it seemed like from all the reports, he wanted this better than anyone. But if he had that energy for back to back, how is that going to be any different for three in a row? And so, if it is, it, it just is one more significant threat like you feel really good about isaiah pacheco 
feel really good about Kelsey even still, you know, the age that he's at. You feel great uh, about you know, what Rasheed Rice can do. It's just one more uh, big threat, Steve, which is why the Chiefs decided to bring in tight end Irv Smith Jr. because they needed one more. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but they did bring in Irv Smith Jr. And as I've been talking with our lead analyst, Ron Kopp, this feels like one of those scenarios, Steve, where the Chiefs, and they do this each and every year, and I find it to be very impressive, they make themselves a week one roster that they could play with before the NFL draft begins. So if Blake Bell, who's due to become an unrestricted free agent, does move on, all indications tend to point in the direction of that. You are still able to do all those 13 personnel things that uh, you were able to do before when you had him paired with Kelsey and, and Noah Gray. And so a little bit of a, a role player signing for Kansas City. I think in talking to Ron and, and we came into an agreement, we're not even sure if he necessarily makes the roster, but a lot of upside on this guy who started with the Vikings, spent a, a, a year in Cincinnati, uh, and now uh, is a member of the, of the Chiefs. I know from doing the fantasy show all those years, you would recommend Irv Smith Jr. every once in a while. What did you think of this signing? So early in his career, I really, really liked Irv Smith. Um, Big Irv. Because we... we we, we we talk about these tight ends now and like uh, like uh, Brock Bowers, who's coming up in the NFL draft and like Dalton Kincaid and these guys that are like, yeah, they're not really like inline blockers, but they're more like slot wide receiver type bodies who are who are bigger than receivers and they're explosive and they can create plays downfield. And like Travis Kelsey's been playing that role kind of going back and forth uh, the last several years and. Herb's not going to be great at that kind of stuff, but he is a really good receiving tight end who has flashed some potential and he's still really young. It's crazy that he's only uh, 25 years old because it feels like mm -hmm. he's been around for a while now. And going into his second year in the NFL with the Vikings, there was legitimate expectations that he was like an ascending player. And then he has a knee injury, winds up missing the entire year. And it's just never really bounced back from that. So I, I think, yeah, it m might be a long shot for him to actually make the roster, but this is just a typical Chiefs move where you're bringing in a, a former high-end draft capital guy who had high potential, is still really young, has had some injury setbacks in his career, but if he stays healthy, still could provide some pretty serious upside and I, I think could certainly provide more upside as a pass catcher than Blake Bell ever did. So I, I, like I mean, I, I, I hope they get something out of him at, at this point because he's, hasn't been able to live up to his potential. And I'm hoping the Chiefs can find a way to make that up. Yeah. And I, and I don't think it, it necessarily rules out them taking a tight end in the NFL draft. I mean, this is a team that uh, they, they wanted to have four tight ends, you know, that four, 14 personnel type of thing. And, and Jody Fortson couldn't really stay in the field, by the way, he becomes an unrestricted free agent now, now that the chiefs have not uh, decided to bring him back. I think he had been exclusive rights, one of those uh, type of statuses, but he is a, a free agent. And so it doesn't rule out uh, them bringing in uh, a younger tight end. And you know, Steve, on one of these, uh, you know, in these one of these Arrowhead Pride parlays that we make, and we have a Kelsey anytime touchdown, we're going to be one away, and Irv Smith Jr. is going to get the ball in the red zone. We, we know that that's going to happen to us because it happens to us all season. Um, and so I like it. Uh, and again, I, I am always impressed. I just think this is another chapter of the Chiefs. Uh, filling out their roster before they get to the NFL draft because then there's no pressure, baby. You can just kind of go with your ebbs and flows. You can look at your needs. You can say, okay, uh, we have a couple needs. Let's take the best player available at, at one of those needs and build from there. And I think that's why you've seen them have really good rosters each and every year since uh, the, the Veach regime took over. All right, uh, let's get to these three players. I think this was kind of expected with all three of these guys, Steve. Drew Tranquil retained. Mike Pinnell retained, uh, Dion Bush retained, and in the frame of Drew Tranquil coming back, what it meant was Willie Gay Jr. Uh, goes to the New Orleans Saints, moves on. He actually rejoins. We, we talked about Matthew before, but he rejoins Tyron Matthew and Colin Saunders, two other fan favorites. Uh, all three Chiefs fan favorites are now in New Orleans. Gives you another team to root for when, uh, you know, of course, when they aren't playing Kansas City, but uh, you'd like to see those guys all have some success together. But Drew Tranquil back on a three-year deal, Mike Pinnell and Dion Bush as well. Yeah, and I just want to say that I I'm bummed that Willie Gay is no longer a Kansas City Chief. Obviously, we all expected that, but I, I do feel like during his time here, like he was a very good draft pick for the Kansas City Chiefs, and, and they got a lot out of him over the past few years. Um, 
But at the end of the day, like what we saw from Drew Tranquil coming in last year, filling in for Nick Bolton and, and being such an incredible linebacker for that defense and that that all time Chiefs defense, like mm-hmm. Bolt or uh, Tranquil's just a more versatile player. Like he's he's a guy they can lean on to do a little bit more because that was kind of always the issue with Willie. Is like Willie would flash this incredible athleticism. But he wasn't necessarily on the field 100% of the time because he was constantly in this rotation yeah. because of his limitations as a football player. And I don't think Tranquil has those same kinds of limitations. Like we, we saw he can play he can right. play either linebacker position. He can come and do whatever they need because he's so versatile. And I think that's really what it came down to. And it's not like a massive deal for Tranquil. Or anything, yeah, but. And, and I, I also think, um, I'm not trying to slight Willie here, but I think like sometimes if it's football IQ first over athleticism, especially with Steve Spagnuolo, you know, Steve Spagnuolo is putting these guys in different positions to, to have success and they prioritize tranquil. And I think they really liked what tranquil was able to do was a great backup for Nick Bolton. When Nick Bolton uh, goes down, you don't have a lot of situations in the NFL where the green dot goes goes down and you virtually don't skip a beat like they were able to do with True Tranquil. And I think Tranquil probably got a little bit less. I mean, you will never know, but I think he probably got a little bit less in Kansas City because he, he definitely made it clear all season long uh, that he wanted to be, be here. Uh, one of the questions I had to him during the year was, uh, have you told your agent how much you want to be in Kansas City? And he kind of smiled and said, my agent knows how much me and my family like it in Kansas City. And so you, you probably got him on at least a slight discount. And then Mike Pinnell, man, why did you ever leave Mike Pinnell? He was a perfect fit here in KC. And I think he's probably better on the Chiefs than he is anywhere in the rest of the league. Steve Spagnuolo speaking of that, Joe Cullen, they seem to have a knack for putting him in the right position. And then Deion Bush, good to see him back, more of a role player. But remember, Steve, just three snaps in the AFC title game. The guy makes a key interception. So uh, just bringing back some key players that, you know, again, not really the sexiest moves, but moves that you have to make to make sure that the, the team from top to bottom uh, is good to go. Yeah, and they're just role players. Like they're we we see this across the league. Like there's these role players who, you know, know the system, can come in, give give you decent reps when you need to. And the the Chiefs guys right now are Dion Bush and Mike Pinnell. And I'm happy to have them back because they don't cost anything, and the Chiefs will find a way to utilize them to their fullest potential. So those are, I think those are those are strong moves, moves that we expected, but like just typical Chiefs moves. Yeah, so let's get to a couple players that are going to new homes. We had mentioned Willie Gay to the New Orleans Saints. Uh, again, happy to see him back under the wing of Tyron Matthew. I think he can have some success there. Really happy about this one, Steve. Nick Allegretti uh, to the, the Washington Commanders. Uh, not to say that you ever want to see the, the key depth of Kansas City leave, But Kansas City viewed Nick Allegretti in a certain way, and that was as uh, a backup along the interior, could play both interior positions, even a little bit of center, and he was key for KC. Uh, As you went this year when Joe Tooney had the the injury, played in the AFC title, and then in the Super Bowl, was able to avenge that terrible loss to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and now uh, gets to go somewhere, make a little bit of money, be back in the same offensive line room as, as Andrew Wiley, and, you know, work with that Cliff Kingsbury offense there. Uh, in Washington. So I, I tend to like the fit and it seems like he's going to be the starting left, left guard of an NFL team. Uh, and so leaves a three-time champion, 13 regular season starts. I, I mentioned the Super Bowl starts. Uh, this is one of those uh, signings that that you're happy about. And, you know, the Chiefs are going to have to do some work to make sure they have depth behind Joe Tooney uh, and Trey Smith now. Yeah, I mean, seventh round pick who got a big free agent deal after being a hero in the Super Bowl for the Kansas City Chiefs. And now he's going to go be a starting player for another team that's trying to build up and has uh, has a number two overall draft pick and likely taking their franchise quarterback. Like it's a great story for Nick Allegretti, and I'm very happy that he got paid. The interior offensive lineman market is just absolutely booming right now, too. Yeah. So there's no way the Chiefs were going to be able to retain him. And I think it, it used to be left tackle and four bumps, and <laughs> yeah. now it's like. You well, clearly, I, because with all the the the, the um, games that defensive coordinators play up front and lighting people up on the the right tackle instead, it's different now. And, and I, I think it's a some of this can be looked at as another thing of like the league adapting to what the Chiefs have done, where the Chiefs have kind of said, especially last season, like, well, we know the interior of our offensive line is elite. We'll just get by at the tackle situation, and it's really hard to find 
amazing tackles as the Chiefs have been trying to do for years now. Like it's really, really difficult to do that. And so teams are kind of exploiting inefficiencies in the market right now where they're like, well, what if we just make the three guys on the interior really good and we pay them money and it's still cheaper than paying a tackle position? Like, I, I think the, the NFL always has a way of kind of catching up to these things. And I think this is just the overcorrection for the interior offensive line play because it's a little easier to find guys who can be productive there as opposed to guys who are going to be like elite tackles. And I mentioned Cliff Kingsbury, new coordinator for the Anders, you gotta you gotta think that Patrick Mahomes was on on the phone with his college football coach, uh, vouching for his dog, uh, as he likes to call him, uh, Nick Allegretti. And we're just happy for him. I mean, he was really great interview as well. Uh, would always uh, come up to us and, and chat in the locker room when we needed him, and uh, we will root for him from afar here in in Kansas City. All right, uh, last one to a new home that we have to talk about. Tommy Towns uh, goes to the Houston Texans. I like what Houston is building. Uh, and uh, again, another fellow uh, AFC team uh, that, that Townsend goes to, but the Chiefs saw an opportunity. I believe that the contract was like $6 million. I got that right, Steve, uh, for Townsend. And so they get a, a cheap option in Matt Ariza, who obviously had some off the field stuff, but has been nicknamed the punt god. And so just a money saving move. I, I thought Townsend was good for Kansas City uh, in his tenure. 2022 uh, first team all pro and leaves a two-time Super Bowl champion. Yeah, I, I don't really have any issues with them letting Tommy walk. He was a little inconsistent last season, uh, despite yeah. looking like I thought he for a set, uh in the past few weeks, Steve, you were going for the Tommy Townsend hair, but you, you showed up today with a, a brand new fresh haircut here. Yeah, I got it. I, I couldn't let it ride anymore. I couldn't. I uh, wasn't trying to walk into summer with that. Uh, props to Tommy for letting it flow, yeah. but it was get, it was getting too hot. It's too much maintenance when the hair is. I long. was hoping, as you know, as we start to integrate you back to to the hinge and the bumbles of the world, that you would just give the long hair a, a try. But uh, I understand why you, you want it a little sharper. Uh, but we don't need to get into that. As a matter of fact, we got to take a break. When we come back, we will look at the Chiefs' remaining eligible free agents and decide who we'd like to see kept here in Kansas city. Stay with us. This is the Arrowhead pride editor show back here on the Arrowhead pride editor show. This is sad, Steve. This is normally where we do the marinated takeaways, but there's nothing to, to marinate on. There's been no games for a while now. Uh, but I, I, as you alluded to that, there's a nice part to that too, because we can take a breather here, but we do have Steve, some remaining free agents that, Kansas City has allowed to explore the open market. I am going to read them quickly here. And then let's, why don't we do this? Let's do a three player remaining free agent draft uh, that you'd like to see stay in Kansas City. Here are the options you have Mike Dana, uh, defense safety, safety Mike Edwards, running back Clyde Edwards Alaire, tight end Jody Fortson. Quarterback Blaine Gabbert, wide receiver McCole Hardman, linebacker Darius Harris, wide receiver Richie James, running back Jerick McKinnon, defensive tackle Derek Noddy, Donovan Smith, the left tackle, another option to tackle Prince Tega Winogo, and defensive tackle Turk Wharton. Because I just decided to come up with this game on the fly, Steve, I'm going to just let you uh, rock it and go first. Uh, who would you like to select on in your three-player team of the Chiefs' remaining free agents? Uh, well, I'm going to go with Mike Dana then to start oh, things God. off. Um, Dang. I just, I, I don't think that we've seen this defensive lineman market truly explode the way some people thought. Like there, I, I think there was kind of a thought like Dana could really go out and, and get paid by somebody <laughs> this off season. And he's coming off of a tremendous year, but I also think some of that is kind of built into his market value in some teams minds where it's like, well, yeah, but the Chiefs had a really good defensive line and they got Chris Jones. So like everybody was feeding off of the all right. the attention that Chris Jones draws. And so it does kind of feel like Mike Dana, uh, a player that they drafted, I think, in the fourth round, who they've gotten a ton of production out of it and really under the radar production because he's not like a superstar player or anything. But if they could find a way to bring him back on a team friendly deal, I am all aboard him returning to that defensive line and the Chiefs just trying to put this thing back together. They already got Chris Jones. We'll get Charles Amenahu back at some point next season. George Karloftis. I am totally on board with bringing Mike Dana back and just re-upping the defensive line. I like the Dana pick. I think he's better than people realize. Maybe that help will help the Chiefs because uh, I think they realize uh, how good he is. 
Um, but of course, they're not going to overspend for anybody. And when you get to this point in free agency, sometimes you have to to get a guy on your team. Mike Dana is a, a player that fits in really well. We know that Brandon Daly, from the second he was drafted, loved him, did really nice things with Joe Cullen. So we'll see where he ends up. It, it does seem like once you get to this window, uh, it becomes tougher to retain those types of players. All right, I will go. I get to do um, my pick here. I'm going to say, Steve, that I – God, I was going to go in one direction, and I'm switching at the last last minute. I like Wanya Morris. I really do. But I, I think having Donovan Smith around would just be a good thing because we talked about uh, going into the NFL draft, how you want to feel good about every position. Now, the problem I have here is, you know, we are doing this draft, Steve, and we're not coughing up any salary cap space or, or money or anything like that. So Smith may try to find a place where he can definitely start. And, I, you know, I don't think even in a signing in Kansas City that would be necessarily the case but I would like to have some legitimate competition for Wanye Morris so I know that at times he was disappointing last year I know it was tough to see him go down did make it back for the playoffs uh, as Morris I believe he got a concussion toward the end of the year I think the value for Donovan Smith on this particular team would just make me feel better about the line as a whole and you know we were making fun of left tackle before but you still want to be able to protect Patrick Mahomes' blind spot so uh, Donovan Smith, and I get to go two in a row since I was the second one. We're going into the second round here. I'm going to go with Mike Edwards. I just don't think that the Chiefs necessarily have that that turnover prowess on their team uh, without Mike Edwards. You always want to load up with, with ball hawks, and Edwards, I thought, brought that to the team. And so my back-to-back -back here uh, is Smith and Edwards. Uh, and now, Steve, uh, you get to make two picks. I, I like Smith and Edwards. I think they both would bring something back to the Chiefs next season as they look for a 3P and Smith, especially because I think I think Wanya has got potential, but he's still a super raw prospect who could definitely right. use some. That's my point. Yeah. And, and again, um, it, it all depends on the money, but we don't we didn't add money to this game. We have no money to spend. Yeah, We're just picking and, players. And I think Donovan Smith is at a point in his career where kind of what they worked out with him last season. Like that's kind of what you can get him for moving forward. Like he's not yeah. signing a three year deal somewhere at this point. And he really liked Kansas city. Not to, not to say that I don't think he would want the most money possible. Uh, I think he <laughs> think it from being around him. He also enjoys money. Um, but again, you wonder if there's ever that Kansas Kansas city discount that comes into play. It's my next pick. You got two. I'm going to go. I got two in a row. Um, so the first one, I was kind of going back and forth on this one. I think I'm going to bring back Derek Nadi again. Mm. Um, you know, he was a free agent last year. They bring him back on a one year deal. And I think Derek Nadi, like, he's not a super flashy player. He, he's not a guy that you put in and you're like, oh, who is that dude on the Chiefs' interior or something like that? But I think that he's really reliable. I think that they really like him. I think he was better against the run last year than he really got credit for uh, before suffering that injury late in the year. And I, I just think he's a good locker room presence that they really like. And he's totally affordable. Like you could totally bring back Derek Nadi on another uh, super team friendly, like one year contract at this point. And I think he, he would step right in and, and have a role in the defense. So I, I think as, especially because it's like, you know, I know they just brought Mike Pinnell back and they signed Chris yeah. Jones. You always need those guys on the interior. And that's a position that they were super thin at. And, I'd like to see them take somebody there in the draft, but if they could bring that up and then draft somebody, then you're like, okay, they really got some depth there. So be totally fine with them bringing Derek Nadi back. And then, and I think some, some of these players to your point quickly with Nadi, like can come in for the veteran midder minimum, right? Like if they're not going to get a, a lot of money elsewhere, you might as well just retain them. And so we'll see. And, and then it kind of gets into the cap rules where you have enough, years of service doesn't always necessarily that the chiefs love that they call it the veteran salary benefit where you can sign a player and it doesn't really count against a cap. And so we'll see. I, I think Nadi is a possibility for that. You can continue with your, your third and final pick here, Steve. My final pick is kind of between two different players. And so really I'm just picking with my heart at this point. Uh, okay. I'm going to say Jody Fortson. Um, this is why you never win in fantasy football. It's, Steve. you know, and I thought about doing Jarek McKinnon, but I think, uh, I think I'm done with Jarek. <laughs> I, I love, love what he brought to the team over the last couple of seasons, but he is, he's so old at this point. I, I feel like he's, he's got to be getting close to hanging it up. Jody Fortson. It just felt like, 
it felt like we never really got to glimpse what his full role in the offense could be. Like we, we got a glimpse of it his first year with the Chiefs, and then last year he suffers that Achilles injury that takes him out. And so I just don't want his time to end in Kansas City on a down note like that because he's kind of been this training camp darling that everybody loves and everybody's like can't wait for him to have an impact with the team. And just due to health issues, has never really gotten there. So I'd really like to see him, even with Irv Smith back in the building, I still think there's room for Jody Fortson. I will. I, I liked your first two picks. I, I don't like the third one as much. Uh, I am. Um, I'm out on Forts. I, you know, I, I think he had opportunities. It's been, it's been a tough road for him too. Uh, you know, where he has been, had faced a lot of injuries, it's been, been hard to stay on the field, but I just think uh, it's time for him to go try uh, somewhere else. Uh, I got, I'm, I'm on this last pick here and kind of similar to what you were saying about McKinnon. I want to pick Clyde Edwards a I like the way he looked toward the end of the year. I, I we talked about the franchise. I especially liked how much passion he co- clearly had for uh, Pacheco and you saw Pacheco right after the game, thanking him for everything. And so he very, uh, was a great locker room leader. And if they don't have McKinnon, the chiefs really have a need for some kind of running back to, to spell Pacheco. So I think Clyde Edwards is right there for me. But similar to your naughty point, I'm going to keep Turk Wharton. Man, I'll never forget that Washington game where Turk Wharton was going up against a blocker and the quarterback threw a pass and he just pinned it up against the other guy's head. <laughs> uh, just the athleticism to do that. And the Chiefs very clearly have a need along the defensive line. And so if I had a fourth pick, Clyde Edwards Alaire would be my next pick, but I, I gotta go with Turk Wharton. So our teams end up like this, Steve. Mike Dana, Derek Dotty, and Jody Fortson for you, Donovan Smith, Mike Edwards, and Turk Wharton for me. I think pretty even teams actually in this two man uh free agent and draft. I do want to say like I could totally see a world where they bring Clyde back on, on a minimum. Me too. Kind of Me too. Because it, it's a total Chiefs move to hey Jarek. We love you. You're an incredible presence. When you retire, well, we got a spot for you, like on the coaching staff or something like that. Yeah. And then bring Clyde back just because Clyde knows the system and they they know they can use him in a pinch. So I wouldn't be shocked at all if Clyde wound up back in Kansas City. Yeah, because I, you know, I think there's going to be uh, conversations with Clyde and and his his uh, representation, and I'm sure ideally he would like to go compete for a number one spot. But how many? of those spots are they're really going to be in, in the NFL this year. Uh, and then you also think about like, we didn't, we didn't even go through the NFL draft. Now, the fact that all these running backs were moving everywhere kind of tells you, I think how generally these teams feel about running backs in this year's draft. But still, I, I just think that and if Clyde wants to move on and like the chiefs are unwilling to, to keep him here, uh, it's going to be for a starting role. And I, you know, I just don't, I don't see that necessarily opening up for him. And why not stay in Kansas City? Uh, it's not like Andy won't use you. Uh, sometimes fans are up in arms when Andy Reid takes Isaiah Pacheco out of the game in weird spots to get uh, LaMichael P. Ryan or one of the other backups to carry. So you'll have a role in Kansas City. And you know, and why not just stay if, if mutual sides agree and you're not going to get a better deal elsewhere? All right. Uh, lastly, Steve, uh, before we move on here and go on with the beginning of our NFL New Year, uh, some other moves to know. You can let me know if anything jumps out to you. Uh, did, the Chiefs also retain their long snapper, James Winchester. They kept Mike Caliendo, the offensive lineman, linebacker Cole Christensen, special teams guy, defensive end Malik Herring, safety Nazi Johnson, and linebacker Jack Cochran. What stands out to you? I, I think that's all kind of expected. And actually, I, I was just looking at it's just coming down uh, now that free agent wide receiver Calvin Ridley who is expected to sign back with the uh, with the Jacksonville Jaguars, also had an offer on the table from the New England Patriots, is signing with the Tennessee Titans that came mm. absolutely out of nowhere. So no Calvin Ridley for the Kansas City Chiefs, but I don't think I did of see, you know, I did see with connected to Ridley, we can get back to the um, exclusive rights free agents in a second here. I did see with Rid- Ridley that it was the Patriots, it was the Jaguars, and there was a third mystery team. That's quite a mystery team because I would have not put two and two together on the the titans and ridley and i think where it gets interesting uh steve uh and again this is me reaching this is not me talk telling you i've talked to anyone with the organization but like i know the titans have been connected to sneed i've seen that what if Traylon burks is 
part of those talks for for Kansas City? Like, what if they're signing Calvin Ridley because they feel like that's an upgrade and KC goes and gets a former first round pick uh, as as a receiver, young receiver? I kind of feel like I'm done with those kinds of moves because you of are. Kadarius Tony. Um, you're you're done. You're you're done with I, the Brett Veach special. Traylon Trail Burks has flashed some potential, but through two seasons, like he has yeah. struggled to stay healthy and on the field. And like Tennessee's wide receiver core outside of DeAndre Hopkins was just so bad last season. So I guess Calvin Ridley makes sense there, but Tennessee's not a team that's going to no. compete for anything. And I don't want to do this to you, but Irv Smith was kind of a Brett Veach special. He kind of was second rounder. Yeah. Well, see, a few I, years like ago. We, I feel like we got that out of the way then. So we don't need to talk about <laughs> Traylon Burks. Um, no, I mean, I, I think I, I, I would be interested in that. Like you, you could talk me into that, but I would rather proven veteran roll the dice on a rookie at this point than roll the dice on a former first round pick and hope he can get more out of him than the team that drafted him does. Yeah, you know, from a receiver standpoint, I'm on Mike Williams now, and I, I, I you know, I'm talking to myself into believing he's going to take a team friendly incentive based deal and i would just i love the fit for him in, in kc as, as someone to go up and get it all right let's go back to these uh exclusive right free agents we said winchester caliendo christensen herring johnson and cochran herring has been a while uh, around for a while now and i think steve spagnolo has liked his growth i think it's also worth reminding people that before nazi johnson got injured during the preseason last year he was on the field uh, competing with Jalen Watson and Joshua Williams for what would have been like that third cornerback role. And if you assume that that Snead is going to move on here, you know, if you kind of play that out or the hypothetical as it is right now, as we're recording at 415, uh, you're going to need Nazi Johnson, who they really liked. And, you know, you got to see how he responds to injury. But sometimes when those big injuries happen, you're better off it happening in the preseason than in the middle of the year where you start quite some many you getting injured in the AFC title. You don't even know when he's going to be back. Uh, Nazi Johnson, you'd imagine, would be back for the start of training camp. So, of course, uh, to me, he's the best uh, exclusive rights free agent retained. Yeah, I really like them bringing him back because I remember how much we talked about it during training camp. Like, yep. he was getting legitimate defensive run. Like, no, this guy isn't just a special teamer. Like, this guy is going to have a role on the defense. And I think uh, th there's a case to be made that he could have, uh, you know, had an Supplanted, impact yeah. Yeah. In, in the Chiefs secondary this season. I, I think Chamari Connor maybe played a little bit of that role uh, kind of coming in and being kind of a, a coverage guy and safety, like floating around the field and things like that. But like, I, I think that they really thought that Nazi Johnson was going to have a role last season and Malik Herring. Yeah. Like he's given the chiefs some good snaps. He, he's a guy that they've developed. And, and like you said, it seems like they really liked him. So nothing there that, that I think was particularly surprising, but glad to see that they did bring Nazi Johnson back. Man, Calvin Ridley got a four-year, $92 million deal Ooh. with $50 million guaranteed. I, that's more than the Chiefs were going to pay. So, uh, Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy that the Chiefs did not pay that kind of money for a third year. He was really up and down last year. I, I don't know what the Titans it's, are doing, man. Well, and I, I mean, it's tough for Calvin Ridley because of his suspension, and he was already an older player when he came into the league. But he's going to be 30 years old, and this is the first time he's been able to negotiate. So great for him. He just got a massive deal. But there's no way any contending team should have been willing to pay that kind of money for Calvin Ridley. Just got it. Should have should have stayed off the fan to lap, Calvin. You know, this could have happened a lot, a lot sooner. All right, look, that's it. We went through all the Chiefs moves so far. Uh, we'll be jumping back on here if there's a a big enough move that that Steve. Uh, deems worthy of us having an emergency podcast. If not, I will be back with you uh, with hopefully we, we got our fingers crossed on, on John Dixon uh, coming back with us uh, next Wednesday as we continue to navigate what has been uh, the Chiefs off season so far. If you like our podcasts, you can leave us a rating and review on Apple iTunes. We'll read it right here on the Arrowhead Pride Editor Show. So thank you to Steve for filling in today. For Steve, I'm Pete. Uh, thank you for joining us on another edition of the Arrowhead Pride Editor's Show.